We knew what was coming. We didn't know how bad, but we knew something was coming. Thousands of calls, people needing help. Not one in particular, I guess. It was just overall destruction and people needing help everywhere. April the 27th is a day that we'll never forget across the whole state of Alabama. The 27th of April, our operation was just overwhelmed by the um, destruction in Tuscaloosa County. But our dispatchers and call takers did an outstanding job. How many calls did you receive that day? Around 4,500 calls um, in, a, in a 12 to 18 hour period. And our norm is 17,000 per month. So it was a third of a month's call volume in a 16 hour period. There was a store in Holt off Crescent Ridge Road, the Lucky Dollar, it's a store everybody knows of. And um, I got a call, I took the call with the clerk Right after it hit, hit the clerk was um, calling, and the clerk was under the desk and said that they didn't know how the desk, if the desk was going to hold up, but everything around it was collapsing, and they just wanted help as soon as possible because the desk that was sheltering her was about to collapse. I started uh, tracking this tornado back in Mississippi. The supercell uh, started coming across the state line, and then we started getting reports of. Uh, of uh, visual confirmations. Approximately 3.15, I had the first officer say that uh, he could see the tornado headed towards Hackleburg. We heard Hackleburg uh, Chief Kenny Hallmark say that he was trapped in his car, and at that time we knew it was going to be bad because all the phones started ringing. On a normal day, we might get, you know, 100 or so, something like that, you know, just on a normal day. But that day was, uh, in excess of 2,000 calls. The initial wave of phone calls that came in, it, it was just phenomenal. It, it was, I'm sorry, you know, I don't want to make it sound like we didn't know what we were doing, but it was chaos at first. So many calls on just all different parts of the county, all over, you know, and, and you're trying to get people to calm down and talk to you and tell you what it is, where it is, after we'd been in there for a little while, it got to be kind of a controlled chaos. Everybody learned how to communicate with each other over the noise, and there was a lot of sign language and a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, where people, you know, we kind of developed our own little language going there to make sure that we were trying to send somebody to every call we got. You know, you didn't want to miss one. You didn't want to leave somebody out, somebody needed help. We had several incidents where there were children involved. And it's always hard when children call 911. And there were small children calling 911 and they would call in and they would say things like, you know, my mommy's bleeding. And you know, and, and you hate to have to ask them questions like where is she bleeding from? And then the child starts crying and says all over. You know, and then the frustration comes in because you can't get your ambulance to the people that need the help because the roads are blocked. There's trees down, there's live power lines down. It's very traumatizing. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know. Um, going out and seeing it, that's not, I don't want to see it. But when you sit behind a phone and you hear the graphic stuff, you still see it in your mind. And a lot of people don't, don't realize that that happens to 911 operators, and it does. And it's hard. The call that I answered, and it just so happened that I answered the same man three times. I'm gonna try not to cry, but the first time he called, he needed somebody because his mother was dead. The second time he called, he was just begging somebody, please come out and, and get her. She's laying on the concrete. The third time he called, he said, it's raining. I don't have anything to cover her up with. I just want her covered up. Well, we didn't have enough people. The only thing we could do was put them on a list. And that was hard, especially when it's, you know, your mother. And, you know, we had people that lost their houses, you know, and they're calling in and they recognize who you are, you know, and even some of the people you might not be related to or really friends with, but they know us and we know them and they're saying, I walked out of the storm cell and I don't have a house anymore. What am I, what am I, what am I supposed to do? And you know, and 
we want everybody to have a level of professionalism. But you know, it's hard to be professional when somebody you went to school with, or somebody you grew up with, somebody you used to hang out with, is calling you up and telling you, you know, I don't, I don't have a house anymore. You know, what, what do I, what can I do? What do I need to do? And you tell them, let me get somebody out there to talk to you. Let me send you somebody to talk to you. And then you have to, you have to put that in the back of your mind and go on to the next call. That's not, that's not easy. Everybody was available, everybody cooperated, everybody came in and worked, everybody went above and beyond the call of duty that day. It was just a day that's uh, probably a once in a generation tornado. When you work with 911, you know that any day can, can be, you know, the unexpected is probably going to happen. It's a day that I'll never forget, and I hope that we never, ever have another April 27th.